Welcome back. I've got a few more things to say about categorical claims and the square of opposition. First, a point of terminology, a small, simple point about terminology. Logicians will often say that categorical claims correspond when they have the very same subject and predicate terms. So if, for example, we start with a claim like no cats or dogs, that's an e-claim, well then corresponding to that e-claim are three other claims one for the A, one for the I, and one for the O. That is, the A claim, all cats are dogs, the I claim, some cats are dogs, and the O claim, some cats are not dogs. Okay? And those four claims are said to correspond. Okay, that's the simple point about terminology. Now, in order to understand the square of opposition, there are really seven key relations to understand. That sounds like a lot, but... Uh -uh. There are easy ways of, of understanding them. Four of them are described on the square itself. So recall that the contrary relation describes the relation between corresponding A and E claims, and the subcontrary relation describes the relation between corresponding I and O claims. Similarly, the relation of the contradictory describes the relation between corresponding A and O claims, as well as between corresponding E and I claims. And the subalternate relation describes the relation both between corresponding A claims and I claims and between E claims and O claims. Now, <clears throat> those four relations are interesting because of what we can say about the truth values of the categorical claims thus related. So, for example, the contrary relation has the following feature. Contraries, as we said in the last lecture, cannot both be true. And so if we know, for example, that a certain A claim is true, well then we would know that its corresponding E claim must be false, because again, they can't both be true. Okay? Similarly, for the subcontrary relation, what we know about subcontraries is that they cannot both be false. And so if we know that, say, a certain I claim happens to be false, well, then the corresponding O claim must be true. So that's the contrary and the subcontrary. What are the rules for the other two types of relations? Well, the contradictory relation works like this. <clears throat> exactly one of a pair of contradictories must be true and the other false. Okay. So in effect, that's um, what's true of contradictories is what's true of contraries and true of subcontraries. They cannot both be true, and they cannot both be false. That is, one must be true, and the other false. And so, for example, if we know of a certain A claim that it's true, we can deduce that the corresponding O claim must be false. Okay. And finally, this, the relation of subalternation. And the way that works is a little different. It goes like this. <clears throat> if we know of some universal claim, that is, an A claim or an E claim, that it's true, then the corresponding uh, categorical claim related by subalternation must also be true. So if we know of a certain A claim that it's true, then the corresponding I claim must also be true. Uh, that also means that falsity, as it were, goes back up the relation of subalternation, so to speak. So for example, if we know of a certain O claim that it's false, then the corresponding E claim must also be false. Okay, so those are the four relations that are described in the square. Contrary goes across the top of the square, subcontrary goes across the bottom of the square, contradictories along the diagonals, and subalternation down the vertical sides. Now in addition to those four kinds of relations, there are also three transformations of categorical claims that is important to keep in mind. Okay? And to understand those three transformations, there's one extra notion that we need, which is the notion of a complement. Okay? This is a notion taken from set theory, and that makes it sound more complicated than it is. It's really just this. The complement of a term is a term that applies to everything to which the original term did not apply. Okay? So together, a term and its complement are supposed to make up the whole universe of discourse, the whole world, as it were. 
So if we start with a term like students, well, the complement of that term we could easily express by saying non-students. And notice that if we take the collection of all students and non-students, well, then we'll have the whole world because everything is either a student or a non-student. And that's just what the relation of complementarity is supposed to get us. Okay? Now, to describe these three transformations, the three are conversion, obversion, and contraposition. Okay? Now, to find the converse of a claim, you simply swap the subject and predicate. That's it. Okay? Now, what's again, what's interesting about these three transformations isn't so much that we can do them and that we've given names to them, but rather that certain facts about the truth values of the claims thus transposed or transformed uh, are, are readily derivable. So in the case of conversion, the relevant point is this. When you start with an E claim or an I claim, then conversion of such a claim preserves that truth value of that claim. So for example, if we start with an E claim, then <coughs> the, uh, the result we get upon converting that E claim, of course will be another E claim, will also be true, which I think is pretty easily seen. So if it's true, for example, that no cats are dogs, well then of course it must also be true that no dogs are cats. Easy. But notice that that preservation of truth value does not hold true when we're talking about the converses of A claims and O claims. So, for example, it may well be true that all planets are heavenly bodies, but if we convert that claim, what we get is all heavenly bodies are planets. And that certainly is not true, because after all, stars and moons and comets and other such things, though they aren't planets, also count as heavenly bodies. Okay, so that's conversion. Next, obversion. Now, when we describe obversion, we have to make use of this notion of the complement term. And obversion works like this. To find the obverse of a claim, first, slide along the side of the, horizontally along the square of, uh, of opposition, and then replace the predicate term with its complement term. Okay? Two steps. So, for example, if we start with an A claim to the effect that all planets are heavenly bodies, then we can slide along the square if we want to find the obverse of it. And so we get the corresponding E claim, no planets are heavenly bodies. And then we replace the predicate term, heavenly bodies, with its complement, non-heavenly bodies. And so we get no planets are non-heavenly bodies. Okay. Sort of a bit of strange English, but that's the way the obverse works. And what's interesting about the obverse, despite the fact that it creates these strange-sounding sentences of English, is that obversion always preserves truth value, no matter what sort of categorical claim with which you begin, and therefore perform it on. Okay? So, no matter what sort of claim we start with, if it's true, then its obverse must also be true. And of course, if it's false, then its obverse must also be false. Third and finally is the notion of contraposition. Okay. And contraposition uh, is something like a combination of conversion and obversion. It works like this. First, swap the subject and predicate terms, just like you're doing a conversion. And then, replace both the subject term and the predicate term by their complements, their respective complements. Okay? Two steps again. So if, for example, we start with an E claim like, say, no cats or dogs, tired old example, and we want to find the contrapositive of that, well, what we do first, we swap subject and predicate, and so from no cats or dogs, we get no dogs or cats, and then we replace each of those terms by their complements. So instead of saying no dogs or cats, we say no non-dogs are non-cats. Okay? And that sentence would be the contrapositive of the claim with which we, we began, no cats or dogs. Now, here's the thing about contraposition. <clears throat> it's really the opposite of what we said for conversion. In particular, if you start with an A claim or an O claim, 